Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for getting on this evening, um, especially on a, a big day like today. Um, really appreciate everyone supporting the group and uh, looking forward to a really good session here. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Alex here in just a second. Uh, we'll do some, some closing remarks real quick at the end. Uh, the, the biggest thing is that uh, these sort of events um, is, uh, it's kind of hard to continue to come up with ideas for, for virtual content. Um, we are, you know, tapping into a lot of our resources and eventually those wells are going to run dry. So uh, if anybody has any sort of content or event, seminar, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, any ideas moving forward, please reach out to uh, one of the network leaders um, so that we can facilitate those events. Um, like I said, we do still have some comment, uh, some content, you know, in the works for the future, but uh, it, the, these virtual ones are a little bit harder to uh, come up with um, engaging content than just all of us meeting at a, at a bar for a drink. So um, if, if you have anything that you want to see, let us know and we'll do our best to accommodate. Um, that being said, thanks again for joining and I'm going to hand it off to Alex. Jay. Um, so I'll keep it real brief because uh, really we're, we're here for this also, you know, panel panelist just dis discussion. Um, you know, I want to give a shout out to Tom. He um, brought together this group, this uh, group of four. We have Lindsay, Jess, Kyle, Sydney. Um, they'll do brief introductions um, and excited to dig a little bit deeper into their experience, um, you know, in the professional workforce. Uh, through this pandemic and some key takeaways um, that we all can, regardless of your industry or your background, um, can apply to our own experience. Uh, I think, at least from my perspective, that the pandemic and, and the shift and how it would impact um, the actual uh, working environment was going to be a lot shorter. Uh, we're now into 2021 and it continues uh, for a lot of people um, to be a very unique uh, professional experience. So I encourage you throughout this uh, discussion, if you have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat uh, and we will, uh, you know, we can answer them as we go. And then we'll also have a, a section at the end um, dedicated to any other lingering questions, um, you know, that, you know, might not have been addressed um, during the conversation. So with that, um, I'll take it over, or I'll direct it over to Tom. Um, All right. Well, thanks a lot, uh, um, and thanks for for inviting us to to come up and chat a little bit about uh, you know topics that are really passionate to to all four of these folks. And what's kind of fun for me is I, I started off my career working in HR, and uh, quickly, you know, after I graduated from undergrad, found myself at UC working on my master's in labor employment relations back then. And somewhere along the line, I, I got the teaching bug and probably you know, transitioned to full-time teaching you know, around 2009 and have been at UC now since 2014. So I've had the, the good fortune of, of, of seeing some students come through now and start their professional career and watching them grow and, and develop. And that's been been a, a pretty cool joy for me and, and you know while I love the undergrad students that I work with I, I honestly I think I like dealing with my alumni more simply because you know they are a source for new information for me on what's going on in the profession and uh, it's just kind of they're 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 in a, in a bizarre kind of way they're kind of like my kids they, they're 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 part of me and, and I take a lot of joy in watching them go and, and I've got four of uh for the people I'm probably most proud of in the world and watching them what they do. So uh, with that, um, I'll just kind of, we'll, we'll kind of quickly go around and I'll call them out and they're, they're, they'll just give you a quick who they are, a little bit about their path to graduation because I don't think uh, any of them, but maybe one were your traditional four-year undergrad and, and out. So let's start with Kyle. So your path to graduation, where are you now? And a brief description of your role. All right, so good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kyle Cook. Um, my path to graduation is I started my working life in the US Navy, uh, where I served for five years um, as a supply supervisor. 
um, got out, moved back to my hometown of Cincinnati, um, started taking courses at UC, um, got involved with the organizational leadership HR program, and ultimately graduated with that, with that degree and have been working in HR since. Um, as of la last October, I'm with McDonald's Corporation um, as an HR supervisor for their headquarters. Um, and just a brief description of my role, um, I'm on the center HR team and we provide support to corporate and globalized functions um, and currently assigned to support uh, global finance. Excellent. Thanks for being here, Kyle. Um, Jess, you're kind of one of my non-traditional students, was kind of working full time, doing some stuff when you came on board, completed the degree. So just, so, so give the story and, 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 and make sure you kind of touch on your two hops since graduation. Yeah, so um, the name is Jess Mayambi. Um, like Tom mentioned, I um, also was part of the uh, HR program at UC. Um, was in one of Tom's classes, right? Certainly one of my favorites for sure. Uh, we grab a, a beer after class. And, so it was very, very fun. Um, right now, um, before I joined the program, right, I already worked full time. I, I was the HR director at uh, a local um, HR consultancy in Cincinnati downtown. So if you guys are familiar with HRCI or SHRM, right, we kind of competed in that realm. Um, and then after that, I left and I decided to join Amazon. I was a regional HR business partner. Uh, we launched one of the first full-time fulfillment facilities in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I was really proud of that accomplishment. And through networking, right, and, and I had some peers there, and I decided to join PepsiCo, where I'm the HR manager, and I support the Dakotas in Minnesota. So I have about eight um, warehouse facilities that I support, including some of our more professional population as well. So uh, really excited to be here and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the topics that we have on our agenda. Excellent. Thank you, Jess. Um, Lindsay, you're kind of my graduate student that, I mean, and if I recall, did, did you finish off the graduate program before it moved over to business school or... So yeah, I completed my undergrad in communications and then joined the HR master's program. Um, unfortunately, I, I would say maybe a lessons learned was I, I didn't have much um, experience out in the real world to apply it back to my studies. So that's kind of gotten me where I am today where I'm constantly pinging Tom to get some extra advice and help. I'll, I'll tell you, there's nothing like being out in the real world and then applying what you learn. Um, but upon graduation, I had the opportunity to join CentOS and I joined their management trainee program and worked my way through in um, various HR roles, got a lot of wealth of knowledge, um, left that and did a complete 360 where I joined a startup healthcare technology company based here in Cincinnati. Uh, I was employee 18 and now we're a little over 70 team members uh, and I oversee their HR program. Excellent. And last but not least, uh, Sid, so that you've, you've joined us. Yes, is my mic on? Yep, you're good. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I completed my um, undergrad in uh, organizational leadership. Uh, I was working as a milieu manager um, while pursuing that. And then after, or while I was pursuing my degree, I then received a uh, opportunity with Clinton Memorial Hospital and I've been working there for the past uh, few years now and I've been working there as an HR business partner and also one of the corporate trainers as well. And what was kind of fun with with Sydney he, he again he had a day job and we were he we were in a night class and I'll, and I'll never forget you coming up to me after class saying I've got this opportunity can we talk and uh, Again, that's part of the fun, fun, fun side of doing teaching is when you've got students that are kind of tapping into you on their on their career side. So let's kind of start kind of digging down a little bit into some things. And I want to start with Kyle. And one of the things he did not mention before he went to McDonald's, he was an HR manager at a manufacturing plant here in Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, and he was there at obviously at the start of the pandemic, but then you know, he was able to land a job at the corporate offices at McDonald's in Chicago. So just walk us through how, how that happens, because you're, you're working at Sherwin-Williams, you're in the middle of a pandemic, you're viewed as an, 
a, uh, a necessity. So you're making the paint that people need to kind of get by. Um, but what did that interview, how, how did this, how did McDonald's of all things pop up on your radar? Yeah, I'd say um, networking, 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 right? The importance of that. I, I stayed in touch with a previous coworker at a previous organization. And that's, that's how I found out about the position. Um, you know, and I'd say just a piece of advice, you know, what, whatever job you're in, just make sure the quality of your work is such that you would want somebody to remember you by, right? Because you never know when you're going to cross paths again and, and need a recommendation. So heard about the opportunity, went for it, um, got a good recommendation, uh, went through the inter interview process. It was a little bit different um, going through the whole process virtually, right? And never meeting anybody in, through the process, but you know, just a bit of advice, I'd say, just treat the interviewing process the same as you would for an in-person in interview. Um, you know, make sure you're on time, you know, in a quiet place with a professional kind of setting um, and just prepare some targeted uh, questions um, for the interviewers and, and ensure that you, that you follow up with all the inter interviewers with a, with a personalized note. Um, so that's sort of, you know, just stuck with the basics and, um, you know, got, got the offer and really couldn't, uh, couldn't pass it up from there. I mean, the other thing that he, he's, he's, he's a little bit understating, the, he, the first job out of college was working for a, uh, a company that's going to be putting a shared services center in Cincinnati. And about, was it about a year and a half into it, they changed their mind on you? Yep. They, they ended up offshoring the operations. So that was, that was pretty tough to sort of build, build up a workforce and then sort of go in the op opposite direction. But that, to that point, uh, sometimes when these things happen to us, we let the bitterness of our feelings take hold and maybe that quality of our work starts to go down. And you know, when, when Kyle mentioned that he had a prior networking contact, that contact was from the shared services company, right? Right, yep. And so the company was actually based out of Chicago um, so we got to work with a lot of folks that were head based, you know, head headquartered in Chicago. And um, one of those individuals had moved on to McDonald's and, you know, just through staying in touch, you know, learned about the, the opportunity. And again, so, and, and what was, what's your main professional networking tool that you're staying in touch with people on? I'd say LinkedIn is super effective um, to stay in touch. Um, email is, is helpful as well. You know, if somebody prefers email, I think it just, I, I think it's situational. Just meet somebody where they're at, whatever their, their preferred me, uh, method of communication is, make sure you're, you're, you know, making a point to follow up with folks, you know, every month, you know, every six months, every year, um, just to ensure that those, um, that, that those, you know, connections. Um, Excellent. All right, so let's let's slide over to Sydney. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I would tell you about Sydney is he's kind of our Renaissance man of uh, of, of of my group here. Uh, I know I know for a fact that he's a deep thinker. He he's the guy that you love to just kind of have a conversation with around. It, it could be politics, it could be sports, it could be music, it could be investing, and, and he can talk intelligently on all of these subjects and um so he's a deep thinker and again you know the other thing i i, I didn't mention he also does a reggae band on the side so he he's got all kinds of cool stuff going but again i, I just i'll never forget when you came to us with that you know, in, in that law class and you, you talked about us that, that opportunity but again go back over and just chat a bit about you're doing a job and when your HR person left the company, because your, your contact at Clinton Memorial Hospital was a, a former HR person where you were at. Right. And, and again, you you downplay what she said to you, but I'll, I, the, you know, my memory started to shake as I get older. <laughs> I remember what you told me she told you when she left. What did she tell you when she left that she was going to do? <laughs> you have a pretty good memory, Tom. You have a pretty good memory. She said she was so, coming for you, right? Yeah, she said she, she was, was coming, coming back for you. Yeah. So, so how does that happen? How, you know, because you weren't doing HR work at that time. And right. She so, you as an HR specialist. So, at the time, I was working for a behavioral health hospital, and 
like I said, I was working as a um, as a MLU manager and also a corporate instructor there as well. And I developed a relationship with the CEOs and a lot of the corporate exec members that were in the parent hospitals as well. Um, such a relationship that I was traveling to different hospitals across the country um, as they were opening up, as they were opening different hospitals, I would be responsible for training the staff before they would get started. Um, upon doing that and having a pretty good relationship with the employees and things of that nature and a good relationship uh, with that HR director as well, um, when that person left, they kept me in mind and lo and behold, they came back for me. <laughs> As and I shared with you when they said they were gonna come back for me. And so here's the thing with Sydney, right? He's he's not working in the occupation that he, he gets hired into. He's studying for it. He's a non-traditional student because even though Sydney looks like he's 26, he's a little bit older than that. <laughs> and so he's got some experience under his belt he just doesn't have that piece of paper yet, but he was working on it. And the organization saw in him somebody with ha that had the, the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities to do the job, but maybe not the direct hands-on experience yet. And again, the, the, the kind of that point is, is having that relationship with people in the organization, making yourself seen, making yourself, the quality of your work stand out. And, and letting it be known what your what your interests are, because you know if if she had no idea that he was interested in HR, she probably wouldn't have said, "I'm going to come back for you." But right. you put all those know. things together, right? And you have it. So 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 you're working at the hospital, you're doing a good job, and then lo and behold, the pandemic strikes. And you know if you if we all remember at the beginning of the pandemic in March and April. Healthcare got shut down, and and so so you found yourself furloughed for a, a period of time, and you know yeah. a lot of times we get furloughed, we get we get shut down, we just kind of kick back and woe is me, or maybe we go into high speed, you know, looking for other work. But kind of walk through, you know, what did you do when you got hit with that furlough over the summer? So when I got hit with the, with the furlough, um, it was it was a bit of a shock because I thought I was in an industry that, uh, as they say, would be recession proof um, and that you wouldn't have to worry about getting furloughed or laid off. Or, well, I shouldn't say laid off, but, you know, um, it's recession proof. Well, I quickly found out that that was not the case. Um, and it's for many industries across uh, the world or the sector, I should say, or different sectors. One of the things that I noticed when I got furloughed, um, they would give me a, uh, say there was a, a unemployment or whatever I'd have to apply for or whatnot and um, hope for, what is it, that, that extra stimulus uh, check that they would offer and, and, and whatnot. Um, what I noticed was when I looked at my 401k, I saw that there was a huge dip, there was a huge dive and a lot of the money that I was saving and I was putting away, I just saw it, you know, just, just, just diminish and um, disappear in front of me. So that got, <clears throat> that got me thinking. Um, I started to work a little bit more on self-development with the time that I had off during the furlough. I started reading a lot of books. I started to brush up on a lot of the areas that I felt um, I was weak in or that I needed to improve on a little bit more. And one of those areas happened to be finance. So I, I took up a couple of books and I educated myself on financing or finance um, and trading, as I should share with you. And I started off trading just as a, something on the side, something to do. Um, past the time, you know, while I was learning and educating myself on different things. And it wasn't until I found myself in a position to where I was making the type of decisions that could replace my current job. 
once that happened for me, then I started speaking with some of my family members as to why am I going back to work? I mean, I could just stay home and not have to worry about things um, and just keep doing this for the rest of my life and work on other projects. But then I got to thinking, or I started thinking a little bit more about why I chose the field of HR. Um, why did I go to school for it? Why did I study it? Um, and realize that I really have a passion for HR. So even though I set you know, things on the side and I, I, I put certain things in, in, in the works, I found myself that you know, when they called me to go back to work, I was in a position that um, I was happy to go back to work, but I didn't, really need, I didn't really need to go back to work. So that changed my perspective when I was working to now I really enjoy my job. Now, whenever they're asking me to do things or I come across situations or um, you know, people need help or whatnot, I, I really feel the, I hate to sound cliche, you know, the joy of, of working or, or, or working with people. Uh, I think Kyle kind of said it a little bit best when he said networking, networking, networking. Um, there's something in that that you just can't you know find when you're sitting behind a computer screen you know for a few hours or whatever it is um whether you're talking to people about sports whether you're talking to people about uh their day-to-day -day lives whether you're talking to people about just things in general elevated conversations how to improve their lives how to um just how to have fun um it's different things so i find myself more so on the uh i guess fun side of hr a little bit more um, and just want to be able to enjoy it with people a little bit more. Cool. So that's what I found myself doing during the, the pandemic. Um, working out, kind of do a little uh, self-development in that area, but I must admit when I went back to the office, I did pick up a few pounds, so um, <laughs> <laughs> I do have to get back, um, you know, to working on that portion of it. But other than that, uh, yeah, just self-development, uh, working on just improving any area that I felt uh, would be a benefit. Excellent. Thanks, man. And uh, the, the other kind of, you know, brush with greatness, Sydney had a bite of semi-pro football, and he's a he's a great guy to go to a football game because he can explain to me the, the things that I may not be picking up. I said, now watch this over here. So it's always fun. So, so Jess, you're one of those guys that I, I knew from day one. If Kyle says networking, networking, you are a power networker. And, um, and I saw that in you the first day as a student. I saw that when you went to the HR conference with us in Vegas. Um, but so talk to us a little bit more about how did that Amazon job fall in your lap? And then after that, how did you make that transition? How did PepsiCo and, and again, you're a Cincy guy. How do you, you're in freaking North Dakota now. How do you go from Cincy to North Dakota and, and, and Pepsi? So, so talk to us about Amazon first. Yeah, my family thought I was crazy when I told them I'm moving to North Dakota, by the way. I was like, wait, what? Um, but I mean, how I like to look at this, I, how I, I, I like to think through this is when I was still, I think I was, I still worked as the HR director at, uh, at HCI, right, before I joined Amazon, and we're a consulting agency, right, so I got to meet a lot of, you know, work with a lot of HR professionals, right, from a consultative capacity, and, you know, it could be anybody from Procter & Gamble, or Google, Facebook, what have you, right, all these folks that I got to mingle with, and a lot of the time, right, hey, I'll add you on LinkedIn, and we'll share emails, and we'll share contact information, and what have you, and you know, when I think about it, it's one of those things where I don't think I've ever got a job in which I didn't have pre-existing relationships with the individual that, you know, was bringing me on board. So it's been that powerful for me, right? So um, I was fully gainfully employed, if you will, and really loved what I do. Uh, but I've worked with some folks from Amazon. Um, and, you know, one of the guys had reached out to me. This is somebody, you know, I, I'm a huge UFC fan. I watch fights and, and, and I really love the UFC. And, you know, every time we'll go on Facebook and we'll go back and forth. Hey, you know, my guy beat your guy and what have you. And he would reach out to me when he needed some HR advice or if he's working on a project, doesn't know how to necessarily go about it. And, you know, he said, hey, Amazon is launching a facility in Cincinnati, right? This would be the first, uh, you know, 
fulfill a logistics, a uh, full-time logistics center. And he said, it's going to be very challenging. Are you up for it? I thought, of course, right? Who says no to Amazon, right? Um, so again, it was a uh, standard application process, right? It wasn't a, hey, you know, you get the job because you know each other. Um, went through the application process, right? Still, hey, you have to interview, follow all the process, take all the assessments, right? I think networking gets you through the door, but there's only so much, you know, that will give you and you have to do the rest. So I got, uh, went through the process, uh, you know, was selected for the role. And again, I think, you know, that recommendation that came from uh, the individual is very helpful. Uh, was there in my role for a little over a year. Uh, and while I was at Amazon, I was working with a peer uh, who later left and joined Pepsi, right? And, and again, uh, I think it's Kyle who will say, right, you, your quality of work will speak for you, right? And we worked very closely. Um, I was asking the right questions. She was asking the right questions. And, you know, the work ethic spoke for itself. When she left, she went to work in Chicago, but she caught wind of this role that had been open in the Dakotas and said, hey, Jess, I think, I love Pepsi um, for whatever reason, right? A lot of Amazonians, as we call ourselves, when we leave Amazon, right? We tend to be a very good fit for Pepsi. Um, the work is very different, but the culture is very similar, right? And, and tends to be a pretty good fit. So, you know, she'd let me know, hey, this is an opportunity that's available. Um, and if I'd be interested, and I, I was obviously, I'm always opening, I'm always open to listening to what's out there, right? You might not always be interested in making the move, but it doesn't hurt to take a listen. So um, I started engaging in some of those conversations and uh, threw my name in the hat and ended up uh, getting the job, right? So I had to relocate myself and my family to the Dakotas. And like I mentioned, right, it's always been relationship-based. I think, you know, having the credentials goes a long way, but also having those relationships and maintaining the relationships is a different thing. Um, and I think I've, I've had a lot of success with that. Now, obviously, right, you're expected to execute to the level that you're hired into, but I think that certainly networking has been a major, um, a major lever, if you will, right, that I've had to pull on and, and certainly continue to advance in my career. And if and any time, and, and Tom, you probably know this, right, when I was in class, you know, a lot of the time I'll be sitting with my peers and I'm always watching for who would be a good hire, right? I, I mean, HR, my eyes are kind of always set to be that way. And I ended up hiring a lot of folks from UC uh, into some of the organizations that I work for. It's kind of a recruiting tool. I'll reach out to them and say, hey, I have a role open, right? Who do you have for me? So I've always kind of looked at folks from that lens. I think you can tell when you're in HR, hey, I think I want to, you know, network with this individual, right? I, I want to get closer and kind of uh, partner and, and hopefully you know, those relationships do pay off eventually. And um, I'm certainly very, very, very lucky in that regard. Excellent. I've seen a couple of the questions pop up. And, and Lindsay, I think the, like this first question kind of comes into your wheelhouse a little bit in that, um, so the question was, you know, so they've been working for a bank for, for over 10 years now, and they're looking to make that next, you know, step in their career. Um, and that would be, you know, so that next level is to get a promotion every two years or so. And they're at a, at a, a VP level at a bank. Now, I, I understand the VP level of bank can, can vary because you could have a VP at a branch, you could have a VP at the corporate office. So I'm not sure, you know, where, where they fit in in that VP level. But it, generally speaking, as, as, you're, as you're looking about, if you're if you're coaching somebody on how to take their career to that next level, um, what are some of the things that you would say say to that person? Yeah, and, and you know, Tom, when you constructed this message or this uh, question to me earlier, um, I think you also preface it with you know before you try to leave, right, or before you leave, how you get that promotion. And honestly, guys, nine times out of ten, that's really the the way that it happens, right? You have to almost threatened to leave in order for, for then a promotion or an opportunity to open up. Um, but how do you go about it constructively? Um, it, it's really twofold. One, make sure it's all about the right timing. Um, unfortunately, so many people are, are knocking on your door saying, hey, I want a promotion and they're kind of holding out their hand. Well, do those types of things around uh, performance reviews, 
around yearly anniversaries um, at year end, you know, or if a big project has been completed and, and then you can really show the value that you added. But in doing so, you also have the data, right? You have to be able to show why that um, whatever this promotion, whether it's title, whether it's money, whether it's more direct reports, more responsibility, really come with what it is, A, that you're asking for, and B, why it would not only benefit you as the individual, but also the company. Um, this is, you know, it has to be good for both parties. And nine times out of 10, um, you know, again, it takes you saying, hey, I've been offered a role somewhere else, but try to be forthcoming about saying, hey, I don't want to look elsewhere for my next career move. I would like to do it with this company, but I see it as being X, Y, and Z. And, and I guess I would kind of add on that is being realistic, being realistic about your own career assessment. Right. And your and the opportunities that are within the organization. Are you at an organization that truly values you? Meaning, and, and how do you know that they value you? Well, part of that would be you're hearing it from your boss. You're hearing it from other senior people in the organization that value your work. You're seeing it in that you are getting a shot at, you know, prime projects at work. And, you know, those would be some signs that they, they value you. Unfortunately, in a lot of companies, we do a terrible job of identifying talent and then saying to that talent, okay, he, here's a 10%, 15% pay raise. Unfortunately for most of us to see that kind of increase in the double digits, it winds up being making a move or threatening a move. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to keep in mind, you know, sometimes you, I've got another, another alumni that I'm dealing with and kind of, you know, he, he made the move, you know, got the promotion that he was looking for, but then once he got there, they changed the rules on him. They changed the deal. So we want you to do this. Once he got there, they said, well, it's not going to be this. It's going to be this. And that's not what he wanted to do. And the good news for this guy is he's done a good job in preparing for life. So he's, he socked money back. So in a, in a worst case scenario, he could go off work for six months. Cause he's, he's got that. He, he's one of those, that five percenters that has that six month disaster money put back. And, you know, that's kind of where Sid's kind of saying, you know, I, I'm doing okay over here. So when you've got that, security blanket, I guess, you can be a little bit more assertive in, in your moves and things that you want to do. Um, but unfortunately, again, in organizations, we, we just do a terrible job identifying, you know, those kind of moves for people. And that that's, and, and you know, any one of you for it, I, do you, I mean, have you seen organizations do a good job identifying and then and make internally making those big moves without the threat to move. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen all that often. Yeah. And Tom, if you allow me to chime in, right. Yeah, no. in, in some cases, right. Where you, you're looking to make that big move. Sometimes you need to move. That's what it comes down to. Um, in some cases, right. You can, work yourself up to a certain level and you cap out at the organization, right? Either you have blockers that have been in a role and don't have the intention to leave until they retire, right? And that's the position you're gunning for. You know, that might be a hindrance. And in some cases, there is opportunity outside of the organization, right? And if you look at the data, a lot of times, right, folks, if you're within the same organization, right, you can continue to increase your income by in most cases, right, the average is around 2%. In some organizations, a little bit more than that, 3 to 4 5% annually. But the probability of you gaining 20 30%, right, is much greater if you do leave that organization, right, and get into that next level role. So I'm a huge advocate for if you're not making traction and you have a lot of tenure and experience in your role, maybe it's time to consider other opportunities, right? So in some cases, the grass is green on the other side, but you know that's not always uh, the truth, right? Especially when in the midst of a pandemic, right? A lot of folks are afraid to rattle the boat or take chances, but you know, 
I've, I've personally had good success taking those chances, right? Hey, I'm going to leave Cincinnati, right? With all my comforts and family, and I'm going to go to North Dakota, right? That's not the most, you know, um, most people would consider that unwise, right? Especially given that you're going into the unknown in the midst of a pandemic. But some of those, taking those chances, I think can be very rewarding. And I tend to say, hey, move if you have to move, if you've tried everything that needs to be tried or have experienced everything, try to get out of your own way and try something different. Yeah, one of the things I would throw out there is at, at, in, in, in the organizational leadership talent development area, one of the things that we've started is a, as an initiative called HR Succeeds. And one of the elements of that is we pair students who are interested in having a mentor with HR professionals in the field. And so each semester, the student gets a chance to meet a new HR professional, develop a relationship, and the good news for our students is that is now starting to plant the seeds for internships, job opportunities once they come out. <laughs> now, the, the reason I do that mentoring program is because of Kyle. When Kyle was a student of mine, he was, again, a, a power network. He would, he would develop relationships, meet people, talk to us. So, and Ariel is, is, had, had put out a question about, yeah, how do you recommend you know, reaching out to that network? And she said, I think she said that, you know, start, the person, she started to feel a little bit discouraged because she feels like she's got a decent sized network, but when she reaches out, she walks away feeling that, you know, they're not really all that helpful for her. And, and maybe it's not the right questions, but, you know, you've got, you, you, you've got your own personal sensei now out of the networking group. T talk to us about, how you develop that relationship with Fred and, and, and where that's at, you know, how did you get, how'd you get there? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so my mentor, Fred, um, you know, he's opened a lot of doors for me personally and professionally, and we, we continue to, to stay in close contact even through the, through the pandemic. So, um, that was great. You know, I met him through, um, networking, right. Through, you know, networking events through Cincinnati. I know those are little, tougher in the pandemic, you know, everything's kind of handled virtually, but I, I'd really say two things. Um, I'd say, you know, when you're, when you're meeting folks, I'd say the most important thing is, is the follow-up, right? Sending a personalized note, getting their contact information, you know, making sure that, you know, you, you're, you're putting yourself in, in their mind, in the forefront of, of, of their mind. And also when I'm meeting with somebody, even if they can't, um, help me directly. I'm always asking, who would you recommend I talk to um, next? You know, if I'm meeting with a senior leader, you know, they may not be able to help me um, with, with my situation or sort of what I'm after, but always ask, you know, who should I be meeting with next? What types of questions um, should, should I be asking? And I think just following those, those steps, you know, you, certainly you'll, you'll get to the, to the end result that you're, that, that you're seeking. You know, I, I've got a tool that I, I use in in, I, in our organizational behavior for leaders course that that I call it's a networking planning document, and it's a tool that I, I have individuals complete that helps them identify what direction do they want want to go, um, because sometimes you think you might you see yourself going down a certain path, but maybe you've got skill sets. So for me, for example. I really see myself teaching. That's what I do. That's what I like doing. But maybe someday, maybe a company that I'm not really looking for or something happens, they, they contact me and say, we like what you do. Would you be willing to be an internal development consultant for us where you come in and work with people? So that would be an example of, I'm not even looking for that role. I'm not even aware that role might exist. And yet those roles may be out there that might be a really good fit for me. And, and so part of this, this networking is really understanding, you know, what all is out there that you might be a good fit for. Um, there was a, a book that we read or read a, a year or so ago called you know, My Useless Liberal Arts Degree. And, you know, so many people want to, ah, oh, it's a liberal arts degree, it's not going to help you. But the reality is the skills that you develop in this degree can open up a, a wealth of windows for you to, and, and doors that you can get into. But it, it's, it's a matter of trying to find those and, and know who you are and starting to develop those relationships. And 
and and if and if you I had somebody I was working with last night I said, well, I'm trying to contact this guy and and he's not responding to me. Well, the the guy she's reaching out to is like an apex of. I mean, if it was like a predator, this guy is like the apex predator of networking. He is at the top of the game. And so she's going to like the, the most connected networking person around. He's like a, he's a VP of a corporation. And he, his LinkedIn probably has over 10,000 people. <laughs> and so, but she's like, why won't he respond to me? you're one of 10,000 people that's touching this guy. He, he's not going to get back to you tomorrow. And so sometimes it's, it's a matter of being there in the right place at the right time and being willing to uh, make that mood move. So Kyle, um, so now that you made that move to Chicago, and I, I remember the, the last time we, we kind of talked, um, you were having some virtual networking. So how's that working for you with uh, connecting with your team virtually and because uh, you're still in Cincy, right? You haven't made the, the move officially to Chicago. Right. So yeah, it's been all virtual up to this point. Um, I'd say McDonald's does a good job of like a structured onboarding plan. So they have like, I have 11 week structured onboarding is who you're, who you're supposed to be meeting with sort of like, what um, are your objectives at the end of each week? Um, so they, they made it really easy, right. To, to put time on folks calendars and really identify who, you need to be meeting with, you know, initially. Um, so after those initial meet and greets, I'd say it's on you, right, to uh, to to carve out time with these individuals and 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 follow up with them, right. So whether it's um, you know connecting on a on a project, right, that there might be some mutual work on, or if it's just you know dropping a note and saying hello um, and and checking in with them, just finding ways to to sort of stay connected with folks um is, is is super super helpful in this in this virtual environment um we do have opportunity to get together you know on thursdays some some days and, and do a virtual happy hour and um you know get to know each other as 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 individuals um that way but uh, again just just anything that you can do to sort of find time um on, on people's calendar um it, it'll, it'll definitely be appreciated by by them Sydney, how at the hospital right now, are you guys in a hiring mode? Um, are you, and, 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 you know, what, what helps you differentiate candidate A from candidate B in these times when you may not be meeting them face-to-face -face initially? What are the, the things that you're looking for? So we are in a hiring mode. Um, we definitely have vacancies that we need to fill. Um, as far as I'll break it down to sections as far as interviewing process. Um, it all depends on the department leaders, whether or not they're going to want to interview with you face to face or to interview with you virtually. Um, a lot of the times they're looking for someone who is going to be, I, I don't mean to be cliche, um, to be a good fit. Uh, but when I say the word good fit, um, <clears throat> You have to be able to have good the personal skills. You have to be able to be a good match for the current environment that you're that you're in. Um, we work a lot on cultural diversity. Um, we work a lot on inclusion. We're not only looking for individuals who are very uh, credentialed, degreed. I mean, you have a lot of people that may have a resume that is um, very decorated, not to say the least. But if you can't have a conversation with um, just about anybody in the hospital, uh, it may be a challenge for you. An example would be uh, if I'm interviewing someone for a director position within the hospital, I may have a conversation with the CEO afterwards and say, you know, what are your thoughts towards this and this person? I may even talk with uh, an environmental service uh, worker who may have seen this person walking in the hallway as they were coming to the conference room uh, for the interview. What was their personality like? How did they treat you? Um, were they respectful to you? Did they act a certain type of way? A lot of the times we're, especially me, whenever I'm inside of the room interviewing, I'm looking for behaviors. Um, I'm monitoring behaviors. What are your facial expressions like? 
Uh, some of the questions that I may propose are either thought invoking questions or questions that may um, invoke a, 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 or trigger a response. How do you respond to that? How do you respond in crisis situations? How do you respond in difficult um, situations? How do you handle stress? Um, a lot of those things are important because, I mean, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic, a crisis right now. <laughs> you know, when when things hit the fan, you know, can you de can you be dependent on? Can we count on you? Um, it can be a challenge to try to get that uh, that feel for a person virtually um, or over the phone. Usually, you try to meet with them face to face. So that way you can um, try to gauge in that perspective. But when it comes to interviewing virtually, I still try to represent as if I would be seated right next to you. I'm not going to overshare certain information. Um, I'm going to utilize what I call, um, let me have to coin this phrase, but uh, professional transparency. So I'm very transparent about whatever is going on, but it's done in a professional way. Like I'm not going to talk to you about, you know, I don't know what my dog had for supper last night or something like that, you know, but <laughs> I'm going to be very uh, forthright with my professional career and um, expertise. I would also like to hear um, problem solving skills. A lot of times we may encounter situations where um, we have projects, we have assignments, we have things where we have to work together. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to entail some problem solving. So I would like to hear a time when individual um, presented a problem and presented a solution with that, that problem. So even if something does arise, you may say, hey, um, Mr. Gaynor, uh, such and such is going on, but I know that this is a situation I have a recommendation to such and such and such then it would be the onus on the director or the supervisor whether or not to take that directive or to instruct you to otherwise but at least you show that you have the initiative of that leadership mentality and also are you the type of person to take responsibility um and I depend on you for certain things if something happens are you going to take ownership for that so there's quite a few things that I'm, you know, that we're looking for in the midst of the interview process, whether it is uh, in person or virtually, and there are a set of questions that are usually designed in such a way and invoke those responses or to see if an individual, um, how, how they may respond to certain things. Excellent. If that answers your question. There you go. So, Lindsay, let me kind of throw one more back at you for a moment. Being that you're working for a tech company, I'm assuming that during the pandemic, most of the work, and even before the pandemic, a lot of the work was, you know, not in the office. And yet, I, I know your corporate office is kind of has kind of got a, a cool, relaxed culture to it. So, so how are you keeping the culture for the company together? What are some of the things that you're trying to do during the pandemic to to kind of keep the glue? Because again, you, you have a, you know. I had inside information because I know somebody that had an internship with you. So I, I got to hear about what was cool about the company. Right. So, so what are you doing to kind of keep that, that going? Yeah. So first off, we were already kind of transitioning to that remote first uh, work style and really the, the pandemic uh, just slipped the switch for us. So we are now a remote first company. Um, we still have headquarters, which uh, enables our team to get together, you know, quarterly, <laughs> and of course, once a year for our all company meeting. Um, but yeah, a lot has changed. Uh, I think as Kyle mentioned, right, there's a lot of structure around your onboarding and meeting with individuals, but how do you keep that, keep that up and keep team members engaged? Um, you know, a lot, a lot of times, honestly, as I'm looking at these HR professionals here with us today, it, it, it's on us, right? They constantly are training to us and saying, hey, how can we keep the team engaged and um, we need to do team building activities and this and that. It's hard. I mean, you can only have so many virtual happy hours and, and so many um, Zoom meetings before, you know, not everyone's looking at you with Zoom fatigue. So uh, I think as Kyle said, um, something really important is 
put a little bit of ownership back on yourself and reach out to people. But again, be intentional. Hey, I would love the opportunity to, to meet with you, uh, to learn a little bit more about um, your role and what you do, and then figure out some sort of maybe cadence that we can continue to meet, um, whether that's monthly and you're just putting something on the calendar. But it's difficult. But the, I guess the beauty is, is we're all in this um, challenge together. So um, continue to leverage best practices from, from other companies as they have made this switch as well. So uh, we, I see one more question that kind of popped up and it, it deals with, you know, what are the trends, what trends have emerged as a result of the pandemic that you see continuing once we get back to normal? So just real quick, based on your experience, based on what you're seeing, what's one thing that you see happening because of the pandemic that you see continuing? Yeah, aside from us doing, you know, basically everything remote, interviewing will probably stay that way. It's the ease on both the employer and the, the candidate is numerous. I mean, you just quickly can jump on a Zoom meeting at the end of the day versus having that candidate come in and try to work around their, their already, uh, if they're already employed, right? their work um, schedule. So that's something that's really big. And you can create that initial screening interview that typically HR professionals have conducted just via the phone now um, over Zoom. And you can make that initial assessment that much quicker. I think somebody posted a question about wearing a suit. And I would say, truthfully, dress for the job that you want. Um, in our profession, I would say absolutely. And truth be told, you're probably only wearing half a suit anyway. So it's a little easier to, to do so, but definitely wear a suit. Try to conduct yourself just the same that you would, you know, in, in an in-person interview. Um, yes, there's going to probably be kids or dogs running behind you, but you just kind of flex with it. Um, but remote interviewing will probably stay on for forever. What do you think, Jess? What's one trend that you're seeing that, that's going to stick around? One trend that I'm seeing, right, is just, that uh, online collaboration, right? I think we're seeing it more than we did prior to the pandemic, right? I think uh, with a lot of organizations, we have, uh, you know, Zoom that we use now for our meetings, right? We have Yammer, we have Teams, uh, you know, a lot of reliance on some of these shared sites where folks can go on and collaborate in real time. So, you know, one of the biggest things that I'm realizing, right, is just the added technology that companies are beginning to kind of lean on and rely on kind of their day-to-day -day operations. Whereas historically, hey, let's meet in conference A and, and talk through this and what have you and, and everybody go do your own thing. We're now saying, hey, let's all just continue to plug in updates on this one side and kind of manage projects that way. So that's been very interesting, even from a hiring perspective where, where historically, right, we didn't have an efficient way of doing kind of knowledge assessments for, hey, how tech savvy are you, right? What's your ability to do X, Y, and Z? Now it's much easier, right? Hey, can you uh, complete this project? And if you can, we can kind of assess you that way. So that's been pretty, uh, that's been a pretty good trend that we're seeing. And again, just the spike in, I think last week, um, PepsiCo started doing um, Zoom facilitation uh, trainings, right? where a lot of our leaders are getting trained on how to facilitate and, and, and present well in some of these online meetings. And it's something that we're adopting from a global perspective. So it's really interesting to see organizations make these huge investments, which are really telling, right? I don't think there's necessarily an appetite to go back to what it was pre-pandemic where we're having a lot of one-on-one -on -one interactions. Now that you know we're putting the dollars behind, hey, virtual is where we are and we're going to train and have folks be very efficient at this. So that's that's been pretty pretty interesting, right? Even when I speak to my peers at Amazon, it's kind of same trend. Um, when I look at some of the other, you know, big organizations, they're kind of pivoting to Lindsay's point, right? I think virtual is here to stay and it's so efficient and cost saving for businesses. So I think, you know, it's just, hey, how can we save more money by being virtual? And, and that's something that I see staying for a while. All right, so Alex, I know we're kind of bumping up on our, on our time, but just a, a couple of things that I would throw out to you. I, I tell my students, and and I know Jess and Sid and Kyle will attest to this. Uh, once you have once you've dealt with me once, you're a student of mine for life. 
I've got a lifetime contract. And if you've got questions, you want to reach out to me about, you know, career advice, I'm more than happy to sit down and talk with you. That's kind of my, my energy in life. And I'm happy to do that. Um, our, the org lead talent development alumni is a, is a cool group. Um, and once, uh, once we get back to normal and UC's playing football in the fall, uh, let me know when you're coming down to a game and I'll let you know where we uh, tailgate. And so we can hook up on top of a garage and, uh, and solve some world problems before a game. I know Kyle and, and, and Jess have, have wandered through those a couple of times and so it's pretty cool with that as well. But um, thanks for, for letting us uh, share with you guys for a few minutes and, and Lindsay and, and Jess and Sid and Kyle. Love you guys and thanks for helping me out. Alex? Yeah, thank you all so much for joining. Um, special thanks to all of our panelists. Um, loved hearing your stories. Tom, thank you so much um, for pulling you know, this, this panel together uh, and, and facilitating throughout the hour. Thanks everybody for uh, giving space for an hour uh, to yourself and, and to the alumni network. Um, hopefully there were some you know, good tidbits you could take away and apply to your personal life. Um, I believe Russell mentioned that this was going to be, uh, this, is, this was recorded, surprise, we didn't know it was recorded and it will be uh, distributed out um, to attendees. So if there's anything you wanted to replay, um, you'll have that opportunity. Um, and as Jay mentioned at the, the top of the hour or at the beginning of this, um, if you have any ideas for virtual events, uh, you know, or any feedback on how our virtual events have been going so far, uh, please reach out to Jay or myself um, through the, the Facebook um, group. And we can. If, uh, if you guys want our LinkedIn, if I was just gonna throw out, if you guys want our LinkedIn, uh, if you guys want to, my, my panelists, take your LinkedIn profile and your, 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 your LinkedIn profile link and drop it down in the chat. And that way, if there's anybody out there that wants to connect with us on LinkedIn, they could do that. So before you, if you're interested in doing that before you sign off, we'll, we'll drop that down in the chat for you and you can, you can see that before you go.